The TurboGrafx-16 may not have had a substantial impact in the United States when it was released, but it is quickly becoming one of the most expensive systems to collect for. In this episode of Retronomics, I'll go over the TurboGrafx-16's features, system issues, then go over the price trends so you'll know if collecting the TurboGrafx-16 is right for you. The TurboGrafx-16, or the PC Engine in Japan, had 17 different models made for it in its 7 year lifespan, but they all share a common architecture. The TurboGrafx-16 in the United States was black and came with one controller, and it only supports one controller. Sure, you could buy a TurboTab, which allows up to four controllers, but single player is right out of the box. The controller is pretty unique as well. It supports Turbo right out of the box. Each button has three different intensities for Turbo, which is great for shoot 'em ups While other companies offered first-party Turbo controllers, TurboGrafx-16 made it standard. The controller has an otherwise typical layout of the time period, a d-pad, select and run button, and two buttons labeled 1 and 2. Other controllers will come with additional buttons, but the most common controller layout is two buttons. The internals of the TurboGrafx-16 are compact, making it one of the smallest home consoles ever made. I guess it helps when a computer manufacturer and an established software company join forces. Part of that tiny architecture is the game cards, or hue cards as they're commonly referred to. Really neat for the time compared to the bulky cartridges of the NES and Sega Genesis. Eventually a CD add-on would be released for the TurboGrafx-16 which adds a substantial bulk to the system, but the CD add-on would add RCA to the console which is a really nice feature. There was an AV booster pack that would allow RCA as well. Of course the CD add-ons are fairly rare, but if you want to, Hyperkin does make an attachment that converts your TurboGrafx-16 to something a bit more modern. As stated earlier, there are 17 hardware variations of the PC Engine and TurboGrafx-16. In the US there were only 4 variations. The base TurboGrafx-16, the CD add-on, a Turbo Duo, which is a combination of the TurboGrafx-16 and CD unit, which is a much better unit and really sought after by collectors. Then there's the Turbo Express, which is a portable version of the TurboGrafx-16 and could only play game cards. It also had a TV tuner, which would allow you to watch TV on the go, a very novel feature for the early 90s. Of course, with the introduction of digital TV signals, that feature is obsolete. And the fourth variation, if you really want to call it a variation, is the attachment for the Panasonic Laser Active. There are plenty of system issues with the TurboGrafx-16, but most notably are the capacitors. These burst and leak all over the boards, and while some of these issues can be corrected with a new set of caps, in rare cases, the acid from those capacitors will destroy the console completely. Because of this, having a recap TurboGrafx-16 is worth the extra expense to guarantee your system will last a number of years. In addition to the capacitors, the CD add-on for the TurboGrafx-16 has a number of issues with the CD portion and which can result in a dead system. And since these are incredibly rare, it's recommended to just steer clear of the add-on altogether and just invest in a Turbo Duo type system. They are more reliable and thus more expensive, but if you import one from Japan and just have it region modded, it's a little bit cheaper. A total of 138 games were released in the United States. Compare that to the 650 released in Japan, you can see how well the TurboGrafx-16 fared in the US. As a result, a complete in-box set will set you back a whopping $20,000. While the majority of these games are under $100, those in the minority make up the bulk of the cost of the collection. The cheapest game being TV Sports Football and Keith Courage, which was a pack-in title, and the most expensive being Magical Case at $5,700. Now usually in these Retronomic episodes I do an overview of the top 15 expensive games, but this time I checked out the 5 games from the bottom, 5 games from the middle, and 5 games from the top to see if there's any correlation on whether cheaper games are rising faster than the more expensive titles. TurboGrafx-16 prices were the highest in 2017, and now they're starting to cool down and stabilize. The highest 5 games of the TurboGrafx-16 are all over the place, but one trend is that they seem to be stabilizing, trending down. 
Magical Chase has had bumps around January each year but go on a downward trend for the rest of that year. It has lost 50% of its value from 2017. Dynastic Hero has really no volatility, mainly because there's about one sale a year. The one sale dropped the price for a month and then it popped right back up. Legend of Hero Toma, that price has dropped from 2017, but only 5% of that value has been lost. And prices haven't been near 2017 levels since it seems to be trending down, but not by much. Super Airzonk for the Super CD has gained 2% of its value after a huge spike in May of 2018, but that bubble does seem to have popped and the game is back down to 2017 levels. Bonk 3 has lost 20% of its value from 2017 and does seem to be stabilizing. The mid-range games grew most in 2017, but the prices do to appear to be stable throughout 2018. Bonk's Revenge was stable up until a huge bump in September of 2018, but those prices are coming right back down so the game has only gained 0.3% from 2017. R-Type had a similar rise in earlier of 2018, but it ended up losing 7% of its value compared to two years ago. Final Zone 2 lost 53% of its value, but it's remaining stable. And Prince of Persia is rising 30%, but not really changing in price for 2018, so that's stable as well. And then the lower price games. The only game of note is Keith Courage, which was a pack-in title. And while that game did increase in value by 3%, Power Golf lost 160% of its value in that same time frame. I doubt that you'll see any of these games crack 20 bucks, so you could probably focus on the more expensive games and then work your way down. 138 games in this library is one of the reasons why these games are so expensive in the United States, but a bigger issue is that the majority of these games were never released outside of the TurboGrafx-16. Sure, Bonk's Adventure was ported to the NES and Castlevania Rondo of Blood was also re-released, but if you're looking for physical re-releases, you're not going to find a lot. The closest the TurboGrafx-16 ever came to being relevant was the release of 74 games on the Wii Virtual Console, which will shut down at the end of January. Hudson Software would release a TurboGrafx-16 game box for the iPhone in 2010, but if you're not keen on playing with touch controls, there's not a lot of legal options out there, which is a real shame because there are a lot of unique games for the TurboGrafx-16 that have a lot of charm and still hold up 20 plus years later. Since the TurboGrafx-16 was pretty much a failure in the United States, it stands to reason that a lot of games are considerably rare and expensive. Region lock prevents imports from playing on local machines, but emulation is probably the best option if you don't have deep pockets. The Turbo EverDrive allows play for any Hue card and is available for $78.99. But if you really want the full Turbo Graphic experience, including CD games and RGB out, consider the Super SD System 3. $300 might be very steep for some people, but when you consider the entire library costs almost $20,000, it's a drop in the bucket. Of course you can emulate on PC and the Wii, but it takes a little bit more effort. So should you collect for the TurboGrafx-16? Well, how deep are your pockets? This is truly a collector system. You're not going to find too many people with a lot of TurboGrafx-16 games, much less a full set. I mean, if $20,000 is worth the bragging rights, I say go for it. But the expensive nature of the TurboGrafx-16 would allow you to collect with not a lot of competition. The prices are expected to remain the same as long as Hudson decides not to release any of the library on newer consoles. With the emulation scene bringing a console exact experience for $300, you're probably not going to see these prices jump any higher than they were in 2017. But some of these games like Magical Chase might come close. And that's the collectability forecast for the TurboGrafx-16. Do you have the system? Are you going to start collecting for this system because of this video? Or just shell out $300 for the Super SD system? Which system should I forecast next? Let me know in the comments below. I'd really like to see what you have to say. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you're new here, consider subscribing for future gaming content. Thanks so much for watching, I'm Super Nintendo, and I'll see you next time.